Hello, Internet. My name is Quinn, and this is Blondiax. I'm working on the tool sharpening system this week. We're going to make the four bar linkage that controls the work head that holds the tool that you're sharpening. Four bar linkages are very, very cool. Whole sections of mechanical engineering school are devoted to them for a reason. In this case, we're using it to maintain the orientation of an object no matter where you move it in 2D space. It's really cool, and you'll see how it all works right now. Here's the entire linkage assembly for the work head. We're going to be making the four bar portion of it today. So to start with, we're going to begin with this piece here. It's a disc shaped thing that has two little shelves in it at different heights. The kit supplies this disc with three laser punch mark things in it. Looks like it's over nominal on diameter and actually a little bit under on thickness. So I guess we're supposed to leave that alone and just work the outside of it. If you're going to do a kit like this, it's helpful to understand a few things about laser cut parts. The laser surface may look perfect from a distance, but if you look closely, you can see the little vertical striations in it. There's sort of a waviness to the surface, and if you hold a square up to it, you'll see that the edges are not actually square to the top and bottom of the material. The laser loses some coherence by the time it gets to the far side of the material, so the kerf is a little bit angled, kind of like a water jet or a plasma cutter will do. Furthermore, similar to a plasma cutter, the high heat of the laser basically case hardens the material and creates a delicious candy shell on it that we need to deal with. All of this means that for machining projects at least, a laser cut surface can't be trusted as a reference and generally needs to be finished with a machining process. Just because it has the word laser in it doesn't mean it's magical and futuristic and perfect. There's no perfect material cutting process. They all have trade-offs. Well, except EDM. EDM is in fact science fiction magic, and I won't have it in this household. Actually, I really wish I had it. The other thing to know about these laser cut kits is they always have these dimples or X marks that are for hole locations, and well, I applaud the enthusiasm and the intent of doing this, but I actually kind of wish these kits didn't do this, because it puts you in the position of having to recreate the setup that the laser used when it made those marks in order to get them in the correct positions on your milling machine. I did make a vain attempt to tap in this part, but the parallels are not going to get tight because, again, those laser cut sides are not straight and square enough for this to ever work. But, you know, old habits and so on. You can see I'm also holding the piece with a small shop made V block there because you never want to hold a round part with only two points of contact. You always want three. Now comes the fun part I alluded to earlier. Using my pointer, I'm trying to line up on the center of that center punch mark, and that'll be my zero. Then I have to get the other two punch marks aligned on the horizontal axis of my mill. So once I think I've found the center, then I got to go back and forth to those two other punch marks and bring the pointer down and then rotate the part a little at a time until the pointer slides nicely into those punch marks without deflection. Then I got to re-verify the center and go back and forth and back and forth between all three of these marks until I get a position where all three of them are on the same axis and that axis is the x-axis of my mill and that I've got zero on my DRO on Y in that center mark. It's not a lot of fun to have to do this, frankly, and this is why I wish these kits wouldn't do this. I would rather just find the center of the part myself and drill all three holes relative to each other in the correct locations on an arbitrary axis. Now, I suppose a person could just flip the part over and drill these holes from the back. As long as you were close enough to those punch marks so that your drill blew them away, then I guess it would be fine, but, well... It is kind of nice to have the center at least, saves me having to get out my center finder or my coaxial indicator or some such in order to find the approximate center of the stock, but eh, here we are. Now I can drill and tap these holes. Speaking of metric drills, I'm slowly tooling up my shop for more metric work, but I cannot find a full index, say by 0.2 millimeters of stubby metric drills. You can buy them individually, but I can't find a nice set. If anyone knows where to get a full set of stubby metric drills, let me know. Screw machine drills are so nice on the milling machine. I can't go back to jobber length. I can't. I won't. For now, I'm using my closest imperial drill in most cases on these metric projects, and honestly, for most jobs, that's fine. I kind of shot myself in the foot here by tapping all the three holes at this point. I just did it kind of on autopilot because I was all set up and I had done the drills and I had the DRO locations so I could quickly put in the tap follower and tap them while I'm here. However, by tapping those holes, I've thrown away the reference that those holes represented. Remember, the outside of this stock is not a valid reference because it's laser cut. So the only references I had were those holes. And I just threw them away 
by tapping them. And we're going to need that access reference one more time yet. So stay tuned for how I get around that. With everything deburred though, now I can go over to the lathe and get ready to turn the OD. I've got a piece of scrap that I'm going to use as a mandrel. That's actually a single point cut wood screw thread on that, if you're wondering. That was done for a project that I'll talk about in a second. And I'm going to face off the end of this and turn a nice M6 thread on the end of this to match the M6 that's in the center of that disc that we just made. Single point cutting a wood screw thread was actually a super interesting exercise. If you'd like to see how that was done, go check out my collaboration video with Rex Kruger. I did some turning saw pins for him for a bow saw. That's a traditional hand woodworking tool. And that was a really fun project. And I did a two part video series on making those pins with him. Once that diameter is turned and the shoulder is faced a nice and square, important because that's our reference, then I can come in with a grooving tool and undercut the base of where the thread will be. That's really important so that the disc will tighten up squarely against that reference shoulder without any interference. You always got to undercut a thread if you want things to thread up tightly against the shoulder. The other thing I need for my metric tulip is better dies. All I have is this old mechanics set and they're dies that don't fit in my tailstock die holder. So I use a die wrench with the tailstock to keep it square. And yeah, it works okay. Not as nice as the tailstock die holder. So there's the completed threaded mandrel. Now I can thread the disc on there. And of course, because it's a right hand thread, the direction of the cutting forces on the lathe will only serve to tighten it on there. You can see it's nice and tight against that shoulder as well because of that undercut. All right, away we go. Now we get to deal with the candy coating from the laser. I decided to take light cuts on this just to see how it was going to go. I think there's a better way to do this, which I'll show you in a minute, but this is how I did it the first time. A couple of light passes, and you can see that I'm slowly working my way through it. It's very much like getting through the outer surface of a casting, although not as thick, but it's similar in that those first few cuts are basically an interrupted cut through tough material that really hammers on the tool. So high speed steel is a good choice for that reason because an expensive insert is going to get hammered to bits. Whereas a high speed steel tool, you can eh, just rehone it after cutting through the hard stuff. Once I've got a full cleanup, then I can start taking measurements and figure out how much more to remove to get down to dimension. That is cutting much nicer now. I left myself room on that mandrel so I can get the file in on both edges. That's a hard earned lesson over the years. And finish on that's actually super nice. This is hot rolled plate and hot rolled has a reputation for being difficult to machine, but honestly, I kind of like it. I don't know why. Now that is very tight on there, but luckily it's got a couple of holes in it that we can use to loosen it. That uneven hard shell on the part really creates a hammering interrupted cut for the first couple passes. And that basically turns the lathe into an impact wrench and really tightens the part on there. We were aiming for 40 millimeters on that diameter. Let's see how we did. And survey says, wiggle it. Oh yeah, I think that'll do. I mean, according to the guessimeters, but we'll take credit for that. Back over to the mill now, I've got it set up on my fixture plate because we need to create that step feature that you may have noticed in the original drawing. And the important thing is that that step has to be aligned with the axis of those two holes. Now, again, because I threaded those holes, I threw away their value as a reference. Threads have a lot of tolerance in them, which is why it's very difficult to use them as reference. However, I've made this bed. I'm going to lie in it. Let's see how I can recover from this. This is actually one of the scrapped turning saw pins that I made for Rex. Coincidentally, two pieces from that project coming back to shine. In this case, I just need the material off the end of it. A while back, the Hamilton Model Engineering Club sent me a care package with some tools in it. And in that package were these Starrett bimetal hacksaw blades. And holy cow, are these things good. That cuts so quickly that I got caught off guard. I didn't expect it to finish. It cuts twice as fast as any other hacksaw blade I've used. So great job, Starrett. You make a heck of a hacksaw blade. Using that piece of scrap, I'm turning a diameter. Doesn't matter what, just make sure to turn a diameter all the way down, room enough for two little threaded pins. I cut a little thread on there and then I parted that one off and then I made a second one from that same diameter. That's the key. The diameter of both of these was turned all at once in one setup. And here are those two little pins. I can thread these into those two holes and those little diameters at the top are the reference now. And again, those are in threaded holes, so they're not great. They are subject to whatever the tolerance is on those threads, but it's the best I can do at this point. So with those threaded in there, 
because the diameter of those two pins is the same, I can use those with a parallel, for example, to find that axis across the part. In my case, I'm going to use the fixturing pins on my plate to get that aligned. You could also indicate down the length of that parallel. This should get me very close, but I'm going to double check it with an indicator. I find the high spot on one of the pins, zero the indicator there, then move over to the other pin, and if we're aligned on that axis, the high spot should be at the same value on the indicator on both pins. And we're off by an embarrassingly large five thousandths, so I must have been a little bit sloppy when I was aligning the parallel with those pins. That's okay, I can tappy tap tap this in straight. That's why we double check these things. And no, that little drift was not touching the indicator needle. I know it looks like it was, but it wasn't. So with a little bit of tappy tap tapping, now I've got the high spot of both pins reading zero. So we are now aligned with the x-axis of the lathe on those threaded holes. Then I also need the y-axis center line, so I used my Heimer edge finder for this. You can do this on a circle as long as you don't move the x-axis while testing the y-axis and vice versa. What we're doing is testing an arbitrary chord of the circle, but all the parallel chords of a circle on one axis will have the same center line on the other axis, so this is valid. We're done with those little fixturing pins now, so I'll pull those out of there and we can get to milling that little step feature. I had to be careful with the depth of this cut because the drawings specify the depth to be the same as the thickness of the table, which, remember from the previous videos in this series, my kit didn't actually come with the steel plate for the table, so I made my own, but my thickness was a little bit different than the kit is expecting, so I had to modify this dimension slightly. I think I'm there now, but before I take it down out of the setup, I brought in a needle file to deburr that edge so that I can get in my depth mic and just double check that. This dimension is quite important in order for the clamping action to be effective on the table, as you'll see. So I want to check and make sure I've really nailed this dimension. There's a pretty tight tolerance on this. That looked excellent, so now I can set up for the remaining cut on the other side of this same top surface. So for this, I'm going to play musical clamps. As long as you've got three clamps on something, you can always move one of them at a time and the part won't move. I wouldn't ever trust leaving one clamp on a part. You're leaving a pivot point that can cause the part to move, but as long as you got two, you're okay. And the beauty of this is I don't have to change anything on my depth of cut. My DRO touch-off is still valid from when we did the previous step feature, so I can just move down to exactly where the drawing says this cut should be and make the cut. I don't have to check or touch off or measure anything. And this is also a very shallow cut, so I can do it in one pass. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy, but always with consent. If I did my job right now, this should line itself up such that the lower relief section is just slightly below the top surface of the table, which it is, and then the top surface of that part where I didn't machine it will be at the same height as the table. And that will give us a clamping action when we create the second piece, which sits on top of this, which we're going to do right now. The kit includes an unmolested disc in this case, so I am finding the center of it myself using a spindle mounted indicator. The nice thing about this method is that you can find center based on partial curves, which is often all you have access to when clamping a disc shaped piece to a fixture plate like this. Careful what you wish for, I actually do like it when these kits give you a single center from the laser on these parts because it saves you a lot of setup to find the center as you're seeing me do here. I just wish it didn't have all of the holes marked because getting all of the holes aligned relative to each other is what's a pain in the butt. This center then gets center drilled and drilled through. I've got a piece of scrap underneath so I don't drill into my fixture plate. This is a straight six millimeter hole, which I can then take over to the lathe and turn the OD of this. Conveniently, all of these pieces have the same center hole size in them, threaded or not, so I can use the same mandrel. Also note that I turned a small area behind the mandrel as a reference, so if I need to take this mandrel out of the chuck, I can get this reference back in my fore jaw later just by dialing in that surface. That surface is concentric to all the other aspects of the mandrel. And if you're thinking, hey, that looks a lot like an IKEA toggle bolt, you're not wrong. Amazingly, I have a giant drawer full of metric hardware and somehow don't have any M6 nuts, the most common size in the metric world. But hey, that IKEA toggle bolt has an M6 thread in it, so shut up, that's why. And yada yada, turn the OD machining information. Let's see if this clamp actually clamps. Where are my Futurama fans at? Yeah, I see you.
Now you see why all the dimensions on those step features were actually pretty critical, because you want this to just slide over the table when the kip handle is loose, but then snug down without a lot of motion from the kip handle, and all of the clamp features need to basically remain parallel the whole time. That looks really, really good. That kip handle came in the kit, by the way. All of them are included. It's a very kipful kit. That seems to move very nicely when loosened and snugs down real good when tight. So I think it's a success. I might have to shorten that bolt. I don't know why it's sticking through like that, but eh, reasons. Next up are the eponymous linkages in the four bar linkage. The kit comes with four of these, once again, pre-marked with some sort of laser cut dimples in it. So I'm gonna get this lined up with my mill once again. In this case, the job is to get them lined up with the spindle such that they are the correct distance apart on my DRO. And of course, centered on the Y axis. So one more time, we do the dimple dance to get everything aligned. I also did a little sanity check on the Y axis just by edge finding on the jaws, make sure that we're well centered there. Everything seems good. I'm gonna bring in an end stop so I don't have to do that again because we got four of these to make. This is also gonna save me a lot of tool changing. The nice thing about those dimples though is you don't have to center drill. So I can go straight in with the pre-drill size for the reamer. These holes all need to be reamed six millimeter. And again, to minimize tool changes, I'm gonna do all of the features on all four parts with each tool one at a time. In this case, there's just two tools, the drill and the reamer, but an end stop in this case saves you a lot of time, especially when tool changes require vertical movement, which is to say moving the head or the knee on your mill. That's one of the slowest things you do in a tool change. So if you can cut that step out, really saves a lot of time. So I can do all of the drilling, then move the head once, install the reamer and do all of the reaming. This little bench block is a gift from my dad. It's one of my favorite tools. It's great for jobs like this. Deburring thin stock where the point on the deburring tool would stick through and hit the bench. Those came out very, very nice. I'm very pleased with those. I mean, I didn't do much work on them, but still, they look nice. Next is a so-called link plate that joins these pieces together. Once again, we gotta do the dimple dance. In this case, I've got a four hole bolt pattern that I need to align on X and Y and find the center. Then I can drill through the center hole. The center hole in this case is actually just for work holding. It doesn't serve any purpose in the mechanism. That top hole looked like it might hit the parallel. It was gonna be close. So here's a little trick, just move over and then bring the drill down and check it for clearance and then bring it back. This is the kind of trick that's super easy to do if you've got a DRO and extremely annoying to do if you don't have a DRO because you've just ruined your carefully managed backlash on your hand wheels by doing that. This is one of many, many small reasons that I strongly, strongly recommend a DRO on your mill if you don't have one. Then tappy tap tap. Back over to the lathe where my mandrel still is, and we can turn the OD. This time I'm going to use a different strategy. I'm going to do something that's often recommended for castings, which is to take a heavier first cut so that you get under that candy shell all in one pass. And I got to say, for the laser cut, this worked super well. Definitely recommend that method. That was much easier, a lot less hammering, a lot less drama. But who boy, those chips were toasty. Look at the color on those, a lot of purple and blue. I will say that same advice does not work well for castings on small machine tools because the shell on a casting is very thick and the heavy cut you need to do to get under that shell in one pass is just too much for small machines. So you gotta chisel your way through. But with a laser cut, the shell is very thin and that worked great. Nice looking part. I'm gonna pull that mandrel out, but I'm gonna save it for later because we'll probably need it with this kit. And I'm gonna make a couple of little spacer bushings. These are turned down from some steel that came in the kit. Nothing fancy. The only trick here is the length of these bushings is critical. They both need to be between 5.9 and 6 millimeters thick. So I'm parting them off a little bit long. I've turned them both from the same setup, so they're gonna be the same diameter, but that actually doesn't matter as much. Now I need to flip them around and face them down to exact length. However, I don't have an easy way to hold a 10 millimeter part at the moment. However, I did find this temporary collet thing that I had made for a different project. I was gonna make something like this, but then I found this in the bin and it happened to already be the right size. So, hey, that's lucky. If you've never seen this trick, it's super easy. You just turn the OD and the ID in a single setup from a piece of scrap, then hand cut a slot down the middle with a fret saw, and then you can clamp your part in there with a precision stare at Toolmaker's hose clamp, and you've presto made yourself a quick and dirty emergency collet. 
Now it won't be concentric in this case because I'm rechucking this thing in a three jaw chuck that was previously turned in some other setup, but concentricity on the axis doesn't matter because all we're doing is facing. So I take one cleanup cut, then I can take the part out, measure the current thickness between two machined faces, and then I know how much to remove for the final cut. If we were doing axial features where concentricity would matter, then I could put that mandrel in the four jaw chuck and dial it in and reuse it that way. But again, we're just facing down to length, so axial concentricity it doesn't matter. And there you go. Both of those pieces are between 5.9 and 6, and 7 microns different from each other in length. Not bad for some aluminum garbage and a hose clamp. If you know the fundamentals of machining, you can do a lot with a little. Got enough parts now for some test assembly. These are all of the pieces, including the hardware that comes in the kit. So let's get some stuff together and see what happens. There's the linkages that we made. The kit comes with these Delrin bushings that go in there and kind of keep everything operating smoothly. Those little bushings go under there that we made. Now you see why the length of those is so critical. The hardware is all included. These very nice low profile bolts came in the kit. Then that link plate thing gets installed similarly, but upside down in the center for clearance. Just so you can see how this linkage works, I made a temporary scrap of aluminum with two holes at the top that are spaced the correct distance apart, and I'll temporarily mock it up with some pins. Otherwise, you won't be able to see how this four bar linkage does the magic that it's going to do, and it's worth seeing. And just like that, now we can move this whole assembly anywhere in 2D space on the table and the orientation of that end effector, mocked up here with the aluminum, stays the same. It's really, really cool. As I said at the top of the show, four bar linkages can be arranged to do many amazing things, but this maintaining of orientation is what this particular arrangement does, and it's just the thing for a tool and cutter sharpener. Very, very cool. I can't wait to see how this all fits together in the final tool sharpener, but you gotta love a four bar linkage. And I know you're all still wondering what that block does. Here it is in context. Once again, now it makes sense, doesn't it? Amazing. Well, that's all I have the time for this week. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much to my patrons for making all of this content possible every single week. You all are my personal heroes, and I will see you next time.